Hello. As an active member of the Inclusion Allies Coalition, I am Lewis Brown Griggs. I have for 38 years done training and coaching and speaking on the subject of diversity and inclusion uh, throughout the United States. Um, I have produced 23 videos and created value and diversity workshops and co-created the original National Diversity Conference all of these things of which were utilized by over 6,000 organizations over about 20 years. Um, I'm also a certified professional coactive and leadership coach uh, and I've even done teaching and facilitating on the subject of near-death experiences having had now three myself. I was born and raised in Minneapolis St. Paul um, as a registered Republican by two uh, conservative original families of the Twin Cities. Um, and yet I'm also a 60s kid. And progressively as left as you can get on human rights issues. Um, but you can imagine that even though you can't compare it to abuse at all, the privilege uh, and the supremacy with which I was raised um, and and prevented me from ever being seen by family or anyone in town to be who I really am. All they saw was that I'm either a Lewis Brown or a Griggs, you know? And, and we all know what it feels like not to be seen, but it felt quite extreme. And so when I left to go to Amherst College, I never have returned to live there. And of course, can never take my global wife to live there because the ethnocentrism in the Midwest like, is so deep that, uh, and they think it's so nice that, oh, well, of course I give you equal opportunity to move here and be just like us. Why would you wanna be any other way? It's, uh, it's called Midwest nice. And so that was my escape. And it was the beginnings of how I got this. So if you go to the next slide, um, I, since I didn't have any abuse or trauma, I needed to get taken into the light by a, what's called a near-death experience. And I have shared that in the last few years, although I didn't for the first 20. Um, and I, so I totaled my car here in Berkeley, where I now live, and I went through the tunnel into the light and had what's called a conversation with God. So whether you're a believer or not, nevertheless, there was a voice that said, Lewis, you're called here to have this conversation and to be sent back because you're not doing your work. I went, whoa, what is my work? Um, and the question was, well, what is it that keeps you from being all you're capable of being? So I want to admit that was a difficult answer for me to discover because I was able to do whatever I wanted, of course, with 100% privilege and fairness and equity, right? Didn't know that anybody else didn't have it at that moment of ethnocentrism. So to be all I was capable of being required me to go deeper. And I, I, I discovered in the light that even though I was raised with wonderful, loving parents who said, we're all one under God, they always finished that with saying, yes, but here on earth, you're better. You have more. And noblesse oblige, you have to give back. But with all this privilege, you're better than others. Well, you can imagine how that felt. That, I knew because I was raised that we're all one under God that every time I look in the eyes of anyone else, we're all equal. But I also didn't ever know how to do any of the bridging to relate to one another across any difference if you weren't you know, a 14 generation Anglo wasp. I mean, how many of those are there among all the whites even? And so when I discovered that I never knew how to do the bridging and everyone else had to do it to communicate with me, I realized that I didn't have any of the power in the relationship, and I do not mean power over. I mean, I had no ability to relate effectively across any diversity because everyone else was by, by you know, by um, cultural or bilingual or whatever it took for them to have learned to the bridging. So in the light, the answer to my, my answer to the question was responded to by saying, well, then there it is, Lewis. There's your work. And I was sent back down. I remember coming into my body in a totaled automobile, walked out of the automobile and told the ambulance there was no problem. I had no physical damage and the automobile was totaled. 
but doors started to open I had nothing to do with. That's the first learning in my adult life because I had grown up opening any door I wanted. Whew. And when I noticed that the doors opened, that meant I was called maybe into a place where I could learn. And if I could learn, I could maybe teach. So when I went to Stanford Business School, I did it only because I wanted to learn the language of the executives who looked like me so they would trust me. Because if I just wanted to talk with them as I wanted to about light and love and energy and spirit, they would have wondered what I was smoking and kicked me out. So I had to look, I had to sound like them the way I looked like them and it worked. So go to the next slide um, with, with the combination of pure spirit at the core and authenticity and all the skills that my privilege had given me in education. I, I started the first training company in the country to teach straight white, straight white men like me who don't get it, how to get it. And I created these books and 23 videos and the National Diversity Conference. I sold to Sherm and it just was an incredibly successful 20 years. Um, so next slide. Um, and then I needed more learning. So no, that's the, the river. Uh, I took my kids on a whitewater river rafting on Father's Day 97 uh, when the water was going high and wide and fast, but it was right at the boundary by after which they would not have taken me. And I said, no, let's go. And halfway down the river, a hundred foot tall tree fell off the edge of the river and landed on my head and my son's head. And uh, we both had fractured skulls and were experienced to be dead until they got the water out of his lungs and my lungs. And with the blood and the fractured skull, I had to be tied up because my brain made no sense in my words. And the picture you see here when the kids are older is 20 years later when we went back down the river to the same spot and learned where it had happened, uh, which was an amazing experience. Um, but when I got out of, when I came out alive instead of dead after an eight day coma, I didn't know who I was or where I was, or who the people were in my room, my wife, my parents, my siblings. I, I, the left frontal lobe essentially had been taken away from me. What a great gift, as we all know, for any white, straight white male you're trying to change, just remove the left frontal lobe. <laughs> so the brain damage was so severe that I had to do three years of hospitalized brain injury recovery before I was back. And I was lucky to get back instead of plateaued at 50%. But I had to, in the process, lay off all 50 of my employees. No more new videos, workshops, conferences, or anything. I had to switch to just me once I was back doing personal training to help white males get it. Next slide. And um, as if that wasn't enough, after years of doing that, well, guess what happened just last year? You know, that changed all of our lives. I not only got cancer discovered in February and six months of chemo, but when I had my last day of chemo in the hospital, I caught the COVID virus in the hospital. And so once I was positive, I went into the hospital at the end of July thinking I'll be back in a week, right? Well, I came back in three months in the bed, losing 60 pounds, couldn't walk, couldn't breathe any oxygen without machines giving it to me. And in 10 days under the ventilator, I was virtually in a coma, but I had another near-death experience out of my body where I was aware that I was hanging on for dear life. And with me up there were some of the others who were under the ventilator and, and they all disappeared and died. And then a day after that, after being alone, the second day I was released and came out alive on my birthday of August 16th. Amazing, really pure luck. But after collapsed lungs and collapsed heart, the doctors had saved my life twice. So when I was there, I had the sense that I'm back, not only to continue to love my wife and my kids and her kids, but to do this work. And I'm not exaggerating. It's like what happened in 2020 was so severe for all of us and all of our consciousness that I realized all I can do is come back and do what I can do, which is as a white male, next slide, please. Um, as a white male, in the face of all the clashing differences we had discovered, I, I couldn't fix anyone else, but I could start to fix myself even further after all my 40 years of en endless growth, because you can't teach what you don't have to learn yourself. I started reading all these books and learning more and more about what my job is to get it. 
So uh, that's why I'm, I'm glad to be a speaker today in this group of all of us. So next slide. Um, and one of the only slides I brought with me sort of to understand, no, back, back that is, is one graphic. I hate, no, back to the graphic, please. Is one graphic, right, that, um, that shows, it was the cover of a book by Frigif Capra called The Turning Point. But instead of just the old way and the new way, think of it as your way and my way. We all know what it feels like to stand in this line because our way is working better than the other person's way, or at least we think so. But it can even be proven measurably that it maybe is. But then as it gets closer and closer and closer to the turning point at which the other way improves over our older way, um, you can really start to lose, whether it's productivity or whatever else you're wanting to measure, right? Health. And so the important point here is all of us knows what it's like to stand here and disagree with someone else here. And we all know what it feels like to stand here and disagree with somebody who stands here. And because we all know what both spots feel like, I want us to remember the ability to be able to relate to others' diverse perspectives with that uh, consciousness and lack of judgment. Okay, next slide. Now, one of the ways that um, I discovered does that, all over the country, there are people starting to do this now, but the one I, I work with a lot is was started by that woman, Joan Blades, who created moveon.com many years ago. Many of you have heard of it or are members in it. Well, now she decided to create livingroomconversations.com. And in Living Room Conversations, we either meet verbally, uh, yeah, visually, like on that Zoom screen you've seen, or next slide. You can meet personally um, in the living room or in your church or in your library and just get three or four or five people on one side and three or four or five on the other side and just listen, listen to each other's differences and understand and be in the other's shoes. It is really an amazingly positive energy to experience about oneself, to learn as we all learn that when we listen, instead of speak for what we know, what we think we know, we learn more. I mean, how much do, we, do I learn every time I tell you what I already learned, right? <laughs> so eventually it's fun to learn how to let go of any concept of righteousness or power over anyone and be able to experience empowerment of true equity with each person, whatever our difference, and listen to the perspective. Now, in the work we do, where do you draw the line? I draw the line in saying, I have to be able to listen to everybody's diverse perspective, no matter how far on the extreme right or left it is, as long as their perspective is inclusive. Then, as we know, many of the ones we're hearing, especially in the past year on the far right, don't include. And we have to all admit, there are certainly extreme versions on the left that don't include also, right? I mean, even living in Berkeley in the 60s, we thought it invented free speech, right? Well, now, if you don't believe exactly what people in Berkeley believe, don't speak. So anyway, we all need to do this better. Next slide. Okay, and so the way living room conversations works is not only just sitting in those ways, but with agreements about how we're gonna, all the same ones we're used to, but how we'll listen and not judge, et cetera. And then we say who we are, where we came from, and question one and question three, we close, but for an hour in between the 90 minutes, we have deep questions, whether it's about guns or abortion or politics or race and ethnicity. And I do a lot of them on race and ethnicity. So sometime just go to livingroomconversations.org and pick a topic you like and go join the conversation and eventually lead one of your own if you'd like. All right, next slide. Uh -uh, so. I think I spoke quickly enough to use my 20 minutes and, and to express my lifetime of why I'm doing this work in this straight white male body. When one day I'll never forget, there was a workshop and some man came to me who had never met me, but his sensitivity was so great. He said, Lewis, what's it like to have a soul that lives in a body totally unlike the soul? Whew. And I went, well, Wow, I've had to learn to integrate. 
I live, we each live in this body. And I believe we've each had prior lives when you, which you weren't in this body, you're in another one. So it's an amazing life experience to be the soul we each are and to be in the body with the only DNA and the history of life on earth that we have, that we live in and to learn to be our full authentic selves and allow everyone else with true equity to be their fullest selves. And it's so easy, much easier, instead of being right all the time. At least that's what this straight white guy needed to learn. And we all have our own learnings. Thank you.